Hey, welcome back, uh, First Assembly, welcome back, as we continue our, our study through the book of Mark. And the last couple of weeks we've studied with an intro, and we, you know, and we, had, we went through the book of Mark, uh, chapter 1 last time. And we finished up last week with the leper. Remember, remember Jesus heals the leper? And I think about that, though, if you ever get a healing, or God really answers your prayer. What do you want to do? You want to proclaim it? You want to shout it out? You want to tell people what Jesus has done? Sometimes I think people get a little weird um, when, when God does things. It's almost like they get embarrassed of you know, loving Jesus or telling people they love Jesus. It's, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you know, when, when God does something great in my life, you know, something that He has to to, to, to reach down and change a situation, I, I want to tell people what God has done, and that's something as believers we need to be doing. If God is doing something in your life. If God has changed the circumstance, if God has healed you, if God has, whatever he's been doing, you need to share it with somebody. Now, I'm not talking about being overwhelming on people's lives, but, you know, you can talk, have a one-on-one -on -one talk with somebody at a coffee shop, at McDonald's, or uh, Wendy's, or wherever, wherever it may be, and, and you can just sit down and just talk to them and see how they're doing, and, and then say, you know what, this is what God's been doing in my life, and I just want to share with you. I don't want to push it on you. I know we can stand a little bit. And, and, just, and just tell you how much God truly loves you. And they may not say, you know what, God doesn't love me. I look at my situations. But as you begin to build relationship with people, you're able to, to share God's love with them. And, 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 and they'll start to receive it. Because I love this next story. In chapter 2, it, it talks about the paralytic and four friends with great faith uh, go into a home. They tear up the roof. They drop this guy down in there on the ropes. And Jesus heals him just like that. Imagine if that could happen to today. I think it would be great to see that. You know, sometimes I get so sad when I see those little kids on TV that have cancer. and You see these people who have maybe lost a, a, an arm or a leg in the military. Or you see people that are walking around and their, and their bodies are just, just falling apart. And I know we live in a sinful world, but wouldn't it be great for Jesus to walk through it? Or even God use us to say, go up and heal that man or touch that man or touch that woman. I think it's a great thing. So let's get in there because I'll just keep talking. Um, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, He returned to Capernaum after some days. It was reported that he was at a home. Now, some believe that sometimes it was Peter's home. Uh, it, could, it could be somebody else, but most, most, most commentators believe it was Peter's home. And it says, They were gathered there, and there was no room, uh, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And he, and he came and bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And they could not get near him because of the cry. They removed the roof above him, and they had made an opening, and so they let down the bed which the paralytic lay. Now think about this. Jesus is, is, has been doing some miracles. has been doing some things. He's been preaching God's word, preaching the gospel to people, and great people. A lot of people were started to uh, follow him because it's something new. Remember now, remember in the back of their minds, they were probably thinking of the prophecies of the of the Messiah coming, and he was going to you know, come in the, and come in and free the people, and and people were starting to hear this and. And they're, they're getting excited because he's doing some great things. And it says a, a large group of men, four groups of men, great faith uh, and in Christ, take their crippled friend to see Jesus. And a lot of times we need to be doing the same thing. We may not be able to take a person physically to Jesus, um, but we can lift them up in prayer. We can, we can kind of bust the roof down for them with fervent prayer to see God move in their situation, their lives. Because it says they couldn't even get into the front door, so they had to be an inventive way to find how to get up on the roof. Now listen, roofs today and roofs back then were a little bit different. Houses back then were a little different, and people used to use their roof for for, uh, for, for parties. Let's be honest. They had parties up there, a lot of entertainment, uh, prayer, maybe some bathing, but it was quite easy to get to those roofs. Nowadays, you, if you look at our roofs, most of them are angled. I mean, you might find a few of them that are angled or flat, but most homes have all different kind of angle shapes on them. Uh, back then, they were still sturdy, and they had to bust the roof up a little bit. But nowadays, you would need saws, you would need bars, you would need uh, hammers just to get out, and then you'd have to go into the attic, that whole lot, and then drop them down, depending on what floor they're on. But this is the faith that these guys had. You see, you know what? You know, the man on the map may not have had the faith, but the four guys did. And they knew if they said, you know what, we'll take this guy to see Jesus, boom, it's done. And that's the way we need to be like that. You know, when you say, okay, God, here's my situation, here's my problem, I need you to help me and deal with it. And I think that, you know, even even in verse 5, which is kind of amazing, it said, Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralytic, sons, or son, your sins are forgiven. 
I probably amazed him. Like, say what? You know, he was almost like, and then, because you know, when, he, when Jesus said that, I believe the man felt the healing in his body. I believe he felt a lightness in, in, his, in, his, in, his, in his spirit. But as soon as Jesus spoke with that authority, boom. I believe that, I believe that guy felt something. And that's why I believe he was amazed. I believe he was amazed. Because some of the scribes are sitting here saying, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, this is true. Now, in their own minds, they're thinking, wait a minute. In Jewish culture, it was blasphemous to put yourself in the same position of God. And, and only God can forgive sins. And, and Jesus Jesus was a smart man. Smart. He knew. He said he knew what they were thinking. See, you and I, I can tell you, you're forgiven of something if you hurt me. And if I hurt you, you forgive me. Or vice versa. You know what I mean. Um, but here they were saying, listen, um, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, he was speak, speaking for God in the Jewish mind. That was never a lie. That was never a lie. And verse 8 says, immediately Jesus perceived this in his spirit. They were thus questioning within themselves and said, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easy to say to paralytic. Your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. That was verse 9. Now, an American standpoint, Christian standpoint, let me ask you this question while you're at home. Um, what would be easier for you to say? Think about this. Your sins are forgiven or rise up or take up your pallet and walk. Or rise up and walk. Which way would you have done it? What, what do you think is the best way? Now listen, there's no way to prove that their sins are forgiven unless I have the authority to say it because the results are unseen. All right? First, you see a person with sin. 60 seconds later, it's like they're inviting Jesus in their, in their lives as Savior. Their sins are forgiven now and into eternity, but can we see the effects of it? Now, if you say this, I'll take door number two, rise up and walk. There will be a definite noticeability effect to see if I have that authority, right? Because if I, if, if I go up to somebody and say, your sins are forgiven, right? In the Jewish mind, dude, you're like, you're wrong. Um, but here we know that Jesus had the authority because we look back at this, right? So if I pick door number two and I say, rise up and walk, there better be, this person better get up off that mat or it shows that I don't have the authority. See, because this was kind of a trick question because in their minds, both were equally impossible to do. Do you understand why they were thinking this way? That this was not going to happen. And, but it's interesting though, to say, if you say that your sins are forgiven and you, you just placed yourself in a position of God's position. You know, but Jesus, we see, has both authority and both realms. We'll, we'll just say the word realm. On earth realm, he has full authority. In heaven, he has full authority. He had full authority everywhere, to be honest with you. Um, but if I say something to them, if there's somebody that's crippled or handicapped, on, and, and I say, you know, your sins are forgiven, or I, I don't have the authority, I can say, your sins are forgiven through Christ Jesus. Th that's a different story. That if if I go up and I heal somebody, or some God, uh, God says, Mark, I want you to go and pray for that person, and they get healed, it wasn't because of me. It was because of Him working through me. Um, remember, we're His hands and feet. He could have done it on His own, but we're the ones that spread the gospel. We're the ones that live the lives for God. But if I can't, if, the, if I go up and I pray, because a lot of times you got to be careful because you've got these faith, these faith healers on TV and you got all these different people in there and they're, and they're going down and they want heal and they, go, and they go back and it's like they don't get healed. And it's like, oh man, God must be angry with me or God's not real. You know, and, and it's sad sometimes, even when you watch TV, you see these kids that have cancer and you see these people that, like the military guy, people come back and they're missing arms and legs. And, you know, you're like, there's days I want to go up and say, you know, Grab, a, grab someone and, and see their leg appear, see their arm appear, see those kids yeah, cancer free. 
But here we see, because I don't want to go too much on my own soapbox, but or on a rabbit trail, but Jesus goes up and he tells them, you listen, your sins are your sins are forgiven, take your pelt and walk. He tells them both. He's telling the people on the earth, he's telling the people in them cries because there's there's probably a lot of people who says, listen, I have authority in heaven and I have authority on earth. And I'm telling you, I can do things in the supernatural and I can do things in the natural. And that's what he was trying, that's what he was saying right here. Jesus will prove that he has the authority to do what is unseen, which is forgiveness of sins, and by doing what is seen, by healing of the man. So if he can heal the man, we know that then he has the authority to forgive people's sins. Verse 10 says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, Take, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and walk, and go home. And he rose immediately and picked up his bed, and he went out before them all. And they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Now imagine a crowd of people just watch this. Imagine, like, you see all these people on TV destroying properties. Now imagine that many people going and seeing and watching what God had did. Watching that there was a forgiveness. Now listen, we don't think like Old Testament Jews. We have to be raised in a New Testament understanding. And we ask for forgiveness. We express forgiveness. That's who we are. That's what Christ has asked us to do. You know, we can we can we could pronounce forgiveness of sins through the scripture and for the finished work of the cross of Christ. When we become believers, the scripture tells us that we are forgiven through Christ. And that we can tell new believers that they are forgiven through Christ. Nothing that we've done, everything that he has done. We can proclaim the gospel to Jesus of, of Jesus Christ. You know, Acts 13, 38 says, Let it be known, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And verse 39 says, And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. We can speak with authority of God's word to people. And there is a great joy seeing new believers who are saved. There's a freedom that comes. But it's nothing that we have done. You know, we see their freedom by the way they live their lives and how they are. Amen. So we learn from this one that there was some people had some great faith. We know that Jesus walks in authority here in heaven and here on earth. And no, we continually know that there's skeptics and people who are trying to, to cause issues with Jesus and the gospel being spread. And he, the next section will be a chapter or verse 13 through 15 it says, and uh, Jesus calls Levi and he says, went out again besides the sea, and the crowds was coming to him, and he was teaching them. Now sometimes let's stop real quick. Um, when he did, sometimes when Jesus went, a lot of times when he went by the sea, he would he would take some time when he would stop by the beach or by the water. He would jump in a boat and just coast out a little bit because the crowds were starting to come and they were starting to build. But it says in verse 14, is, As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax booth. And he said, Then follow me. And he rose and followed him. Once again, it was immediate. Immediate. He dropped. You know, he dropped what he was doing. He followed him. And he reclined at the table of his house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. Now Levi is Matthew, who was a Jew, who was a tax collector, who was despised. They were, they were, they were considered traitors to the, to, to the cause or to Israel. Uh, they were, and they were called basically thieves for Rome. They, were, they, they would take a lot of the tax that the Romans would want, and they would put an exorbitant amount on for themselves. That's why they, people really didn't care for them. Uh, but Jesus asks, follow me, and he really does. And it, and it says, the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, a lot of times, we, even when we think about that, we were brought up in the church that you're supposed to separate yourself from the world, and, and, and that is a truth. That is a truth. We are to be different from the world. You know, when you read the book of Leviticus, when God was speaking directly to the Jew, kind of lays some different things on how, where, what you're supposed to do, but you're not supposed to look like the world. You're not supposed to be of the world. We're supposed to be in. We're in this world, but we're not supposed to be. Um, we're not supposed to be, you know, aligned with this world. You know what I mean? We're not supposed to be re um, recognized as the world, but um, we need to stand out from that. But not being so obnoxious. But you know, let me ask you this: How many people do you know that 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 maybe you invite to your home, or maybe you go out to lunch or dinner with, or you socialize with? that don't know Jesus. And, you know, I can see Jesus saying, listen, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but he came, 
to not call the righteous but the sinners. And, and that, how are we supposed to preach the gospel to them? How are we supposed to love them? How are we supposed to reach them if we can't build a relationship with people? He's not saying do the things they do. You know, if I go to a restaurant like Olive Garden, Olive Garden is an Italian restaurant, they have wine, they have alcohol. I don't go there to drink the alcohol, but I go there to eat the spaghetti. But I get to talk to the people that are on me in that place, that who even the waiter or the waitress that maybe don't know Christ, and I get to get, you know build build a relationship with them. That's what he's that's what he's doing here, you know. And 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 you think about this is that you know it says in verse seventeen, and Jesus heard and he said to them, those who um, who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Listen. Jesus doesn't give excuse for the behavior of those he's, who's he's eating with. And I don't get, make, I don't make a, an excuse for people I eat with. Listen, it, it, that's their choice. That's their life. And it's not right. You know, but I'm, you know, if, if we keep trying to usurp the Holy Spirit's job, how's he ever going to do it? Remember, he brings life and hope and encouragement. Listen, we know it's not healthy to drink alcohol. We know it's not healthy to smoke. But if we keep on beating on someone's head, you're going to get cancer, you're going to die and go to hell. He's never going to want to receive Christ. All he gets is this guy, is this judgmental God who wants to send him to hell. But Jesus, Jesus, um, he made it clear, you know. They were sick and they were and they weren't well. Uh, Jesus' mission was to rescue the lost. You know, there, there's going to be people that we're going to come across. These people uh, reject the call of the cross. But they need to repent, and they, and you know, and and some of these people, the religious leaders, they felt that they kept the law of Moses, and they were so self-righteous. They were right; they didn't need anything else. They felt they need need forgiveness, and and Jesus is trying to reach them, and Jesus is trying to reach everybody. Listen, Jesus says, "I am talking to those who know that they are sinners, and they understand that the heathen. It's, it's almost like the heathen is easier to reach. This is true." The heathen seems like it's easier to reach than a religious leader because they feel like the religious leaders feel like they got it all together. They have it all. Did you ever meet those kind of people that, that they think that, well, they, they, they walk around like they have it all together, but deep and down inside they're broken down and they're crying. They need help, but they're too prideful to come on and ask for help. They're too prideful. But here you see Jesus saying, listen, these people are easy to reach because you're so self-righteous in yourself. You're so prideful and arrogant. And, and, and he's saying, listen, I came to help these people. I came to break through that, that mindset. I came to help them to, to know who, what the truth is. You know, if you really consider the heathens to the religious Peter, people, it's almost like the prodigal son story. Here you have, remember the prodigal son story? Where... One demands his inheritance, kind of immaturity, demand, no one, no, no, no. But he goes off and he squanders it, and then he has a self righteous brother stands at home. What's the difference between what he's talking about here and there? Uh, we, we, we need to reach out. I'm not saying hang out in bars and clubs, guys. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying that you need to have Christian friends who are godly to encourage you, love you, to hang around with. But also, you know, like, like my, like, we need to have friends who, who maybe don't know Christ and then we need to be able to, to reach out to them because we came to, to love them. We came, Christ came to love them. He died for them too, just as much as He died for me. And you. Amen? Now the leaders are asking a question about fasting in verse 18. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to them, Why, does, why do John's disciples and disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now the Pharisees had a weekly fast and so did John the Baptist. But what, this was not part of the Mosaic Law. This became more of a Jewish understanding of the law. It was more, this weekly fast that they're talking about here was more of a tradition in, in Judaism. And Jesus said to them, Can a wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now remember, Jesus is the bridegroom. We're, we're, we're the bride. We're the church. You know, you know, paraphrase, who fasts, in a sense, who fasts when we're celebrating? When there's a party, when we're celebrating, no one goes to a party and says, you know what, I'm fasting. 
And I'm walking into Dawson. No. Here I am with my intended, Jesus saying. Fasting is, is sorrowful and mourning. There's a party going on. We're going to celebrate. Why? <laughs> Jesus is here. We're going to celebrate. How much fun was it when you got engaged? Seriously, when you got engaged with Mary, what did you do? You probably went out and you told everybody you were happy. You put your arm around her. You were smiling. You know, you were showing your, your, bri your bride to be off. Look at her. Check her out. She's gorgeous. You know? Here you go. There was no morning. Engaged couples seem like they're smiling from a time of the anticipation of marriage. That is what Christianity is about. We need to be celebrating because one day there is going to be a marriage supper. There is one day we're going to be Jesus is going to come back and get us. Amen? How can they take on sorrow when there is so much joy? It says, The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Verse 20, And they will fast in that day. Referring to, I assume, um, even for them, at this time, we can look at that verse and say, we can assume that it was when he died and he was buried. Those three days. Excuse me. When he's talking about we can fast in. Jesus is gone now. They're going to fast. They're going to mourn. They're going to weep. They're going to cry. Some will scatter. But it says, No one sews a piece of un unshrunk clothes on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, and the new one, the new from the old, and the worst tear is made. And no one puts on a new wine on old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst in skins. The wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. Now, it's a very important uh, verse here is an idea. You don't place an unshrunk piece of cloth on an old shirt. That is done shrinking because the new patch will shrink. I remember putting those on my blue jeans when I was a kid. I don't know those uh, those patches on my on my pants. Then we had that kind of problem. Just like leather, though, it will stretch because of the gas fermentation of the of the wine. So what is Jesus saying? Christianity is not to be patched up by Judaism. God never intended Christianity to fill an old container of the Mosaic Law. If you both, if you do, both will get ruined. If you place our faith in Christ on the garment of Judaism, the practice of the Old Testament will result, it will be ruined. Don't carry your faith in a wineskin of Judaism. It will burst. The Jews learned the hard way. <clears throat> Remember when the Jews back in Acts, um, when the Jews said you must be circumcised first, you must become a Jew before you became a Christian. Kind of like putting a new patch on the wineskins. You didn't have to. It says in Acts 15, it says, some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Wow, I can't be saved. Wow. And he goes on and says, And the apostles and the elders were gathered together, considering the matter. And after much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made you choose choice among you, that by mouth the Gentiles could hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between them and us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. Even in churches today, we argue over scriptures. We must understand this. Even when we talk about the next couple, we're going to talk about the Sabbath. And if you don't understand what the Sabbath is, the next couple of chapters are probably going to really mess you up. But we don't... Listen. Old Covenant, leave it. It's, we don't... You glean off the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. You grow, from the, you, you, you grow in grace and faith in the New Covenant. <clears throat> Verse 23. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields and he made the way and his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. Now, in, in, in the law, part of the, part of the harvesting was considered work from the scribes and Pharisees' point of view. That's what I understand. Pharisees saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful, what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was in need of hungry? 
he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abethar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he also gave some who were with him. He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man will be Lord even of the Sabbath. Before David was king and he served on his king Saul, he ate some grain alongside of his men. Listen, the Sabbath, listen, human need should take precedent over ceremonial law. That's what he's trying to say to them. The need outweighed the law over the law. The Sabbath was to serve the people, not the, the people to serve the Sabbath. It became a heavy burden instead of a day of refreshing. The Sabbath for us is a time we celebrate. We just we bask in God's presence. Now, it's good to take a day off of work. It is. Work six days, take one day off. But for new day, new Christians, listen, for us as new believers or believers in Christ, your Sabbath should be every day. Not that you don't do anything, but you're putting your rest in Jesus Christ to finish work of the cross. See, in Exodus it says this in verse 31, 12 through 17. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak of the people of Israel, say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For the sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off among his people. Six days shall be done, or six days or six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does the work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall be Keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout the generations as a covenant forever. It's a sign before ever between me and the people of Israel. In the six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, and the seventh day he rested. He was refreshed. And who was God talking to? Right? The people of Israel. A covenant with God. There are many people taught today that the body of Christ took over Israel. Um, spiritual Israel, as an assumption, that, that is an assumption made. Uh, they call it the replacement theology. It, it's a wrong theology. That's something I do not believe. We are we are we are a family. We are Jew and Gentile. That's what Paul was saying in the New Testament. We are children of God, not under the Mosaic law. Um, take a day for rest, not for legalism, but for wisdom. And that's what I meant earlier. We need to be we need to be in a place with every day that we rest in the finished work of the cross. And yes, take a day off for work, relax, do what God has done. But don't make it legalistic. I know churches nowadays that I said, you have to have church on Saturday, and that's it. It's like, that's what he was trying to say. No, you, you don't. You can have church any day of the week. Because Galatians 3 says this, in verse 27 through 29, For as many of you were baptized in Christ, having put on Christ, neither, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The Sabbath to you and I is resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. On the cross, what he did, no longer working for salvation and resting in what he did. We don't have to work. At, I mean, we, don't, we can't earn salvation. It was given to us. And we need to rest in the fact that Jesus took care of it and have that faith and peace. Hebrews 4, 8-11 says this, For if Joshua had given him rest, God would not have spoken another they law or another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the God for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has, has rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same source of disobedience. Rest in the salvation that Christ offered freely. Take it and enjoy what he did. Faith in Jesus, plain and simple. Rest in Christ. You know, we, we, we think about some of the things that, you know, even this. There are a lot of people, they, in the, in, in the Old Testament, even with tithing, I think I mentioned this before. <clears throat> with tithing, everybody says, well, I give my 10%. And that's great. But in the New Testament, God wants everything. He wants everything. And in the Old Testament, it wasn't like 10% of your pay. It was, you gave a lot more than what you did. 
And, you know, the sad part about Christianity is sometimes you have to watch because some people pick some stuff from the Old Testament and they live by it, and some people from the, they, and they pick something from the New Testament. Uh, you need to pick the whole Bible up and read it. And, and, and it's one book. It's, 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 it's one complete book. Um, many different authors, many different books, many different chapters. Uh, read it as one book. Where God spoke to the, to, the, to the Jew in the Old Testament and gave him strict orders, and that was for the Jew to follow. Whereas we see the New Testament, the coming of the Messiah, which the Old Testament prophesied. You know, they didn't accept Jesus. Hey, we did. We look back at this. You know, we, we can look back as, as we read, but you know, we need to be careful that we don't tie on legalistic things. You know, as long as we do this, that we are resting in, this, in the fact that Jesus Christ and what He did. That's only what we're trying to do for salvation to. Um, rest in the fact that Jesus, the finished work of the cross. Rest in the fact that Jesus did it. Rest in the fact that the, how we help is we can't help. All we can do is surrender our lives to Him and do what He's called us to do or asked us to do. And, you know, they, they, wanted, they, they, they wanted you to toe the line, but we could never, you could never fulfill the law. But Jesus did it. He did it for us. So we need to rest in that. Have that. But our Sabbath is not just one day a week. Our Sabbath should be resting in Christ every day. And because there's people out there that, that, that are Christians who love Jesus who work Sundays. And if all we go around and say, well, you should be working on Sunday, we're, we're, we're really not preaching the gospel to them. We're speaking judgment. You know, we're speaking our opinion and not what the Word of God says. We need to be careful of that. Be careful about putting trying to, to match up some of the Old Testament stuff with what with, with they were doing. You know, hey, you got to become a Jew. you got to get circumcised. You know what I'm saying? And before you be, become before you become Christians. Don't add stuff to, to what salvation is about. Christ did it. It's all on Him. It's faith alone and Christ alone by His grace and mercy. And when we think about people that Jesus calls, it doesn't matter what they look like or what they do for a living, who they are. <clears throat> Jesus will call people. Even the tax collectors were evil, meats, thieves, and everything. You know? And I, I think we need to be careful. Be careful before we, before we put a label on somebody. And even today we talked about how Jesus did miracles. Christ had the authority. It was only Christ's authority. That he, he, he and as and God continually opens the door for us to minister to people out in the world, <clears throat> be in tune with what he's saying. If he goes up and says, hey, pray for that person. We may not know what they need, but God may answer that prayer because you were faithful to go over and do it and able to share the gospel. Well, that's chapter 2 for you. Please study chapter 3 for next week. But like I said, we covered over a paralytic about God's authority, people of faith, people to bring hope, uh, telling God telling who I am or who He is. Uh, he's able to forgive here on earth and in heaven. He's got the authority here on earth and here in heaven. And then Jesus picks whoever He wants to pick. Whoever has a heart to serve him. And it says Matthew, he jumped, he jumped, whatever he was doing, he went with him. And by fasting, there, there is a proper time of fasting for us. There is a time. There is a time that we need to take some time and fast and pray. But the, what he was talking about here is, listen, those guys would have been partying with Jesus. They were hanging out with Jesus. And, and I can't wait that it happens. That's an engagement kind of thing, like I mentioned earlier. When you got engaged, you were excited. You didn't start mourning over it, right? You were excited about the marriage. And so, so should we be. And like I said, if Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, listen. Rest in the fact and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is your Sabbath rest. That's what you rest in. Knowing that there's nothing you can ever do to earn your salvation that is freely given to you. And then, honestly, if you want to look at the Old Testament, grab a hold of one day and say, you know what, take a day off. It doesn't matter what day it is. Sunday through Friday or Sunday through Monday doesn't matter but when you do enjoy yourself take a rest relax but still keep in mind knowing that Jesus Christ is there is is, is, is finished work did it for you I mean amen let's pray father I thank you for your word and I thank you father that your spirit simplifies your word to us and I, and I pray Lord that as even as we begin to study even more Lord, that we go back and read what you what what they was wrote Lord that we would learn even more that your spirit would speak to us loud and clear 
We thank you, Lord, for an advance for all you're doing. Lord, we ask you to put people in our lives, Father, that we can pray over, Lord, that, that, that your authority would go through us, Father, and heal people and set people free, Father. I thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye.